You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. Now, TSPN presents Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Good morning and welcome to Love, Hope, and Faith. My name is Heather Murdoch and I'm so happy you've joined me this morning. And uh, It's a crisp, cold morning here in Amador County and uh, bundle up because it's, it's cold out there. And please drive safely. The roads are very icy and uh, there's been a lot of accidents in our county lately, so please drive safe. Nothing's worth, you know, being a few minutes late is okay as long as you get there safely. So I uh, just wanted to... Uh, Today's show is, I don't have a guest today, and uh, I'm just going to talk from my heart today about my life and about things I've been through and how I've overcome those things. And a lot of people have been asking me, as more viewers, uh, as the show becomes more popular, people have started to ask me what my testimony is and if there's any way they can watch my testimony or hear my testimony. And I think the reason they ask that is because I'm so in love with Jesus and I'm so passionate about my faith. <laughs> and... Um, People want to know where that came from. People want to know, you know, how did I get to be where I am now? And uh, and I've shared a lot that I do have a testimony, and we all do. We all have a story, a life story, and uh, people want to know how I got to where I was, to where I am now, in in my faith. And so today I'm going to be sharing my testimony. Uh, when the show first started about a year and a half ago, I shared my testimony, um, but it's been a while, and new things have happened. And you know, every day is a new day, and this is a day the Lord has made, and He has done a mighty work in me, and He's continuing to do so. And I want to share that. That's kind of what I'm about. And uh, this show, Love, Hope, and Faith, has been a blessing for me to be a part of. And I'm so thankful at the opportunity every week to sit here many times with wonderful guests who share their faith, who share their life stories, who share their hope, the hope in Jesus. And um, it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful show. And uh, yeah, so... My my life story, you know, I grew up, I'm kind of a local girl. I grew up in, in uh, Calaveras County, and um, my my life was difficult, you know, like many of you, uh, kind of come from a dysfunctional family, although I'm hard-pressed to find a functional family <laughs> in this day and age, but, you know, came from a family of um, kind of being lost. When I say lost, what I mean is not really having a faith as an anchor, um, just kind of living out of uh, pain and experiences that my parents had in their childhood that kind of got brought into their their life as adults and um, and uh, my my life story started um, my parents were hippies and uh, it's a funny word but they were kind of living off the land and and um, my parents were uh, very, they were from Southern California and came up here to get out of the rat race and we lived off the land. We, like I said, we, we lived in teepees and school buses. I mean, literally, I think I lived in a house when I was really young, but for the majority of my life, we didn't even live in a, in a real home. We lived in, in trailers, school buses, teepees, just kind of making it on, on you know, a whim and a dream. Really, my parents' dream. And, um, and I will say that, of course, my, I know my parents loved me very much. I know I was, had a very close relationship with my mom. And I had great close moments with my father, too. But um, my father, you know, I've forgiven him and, and moved on in my life and, and let this all go. But just to share the story, my dad, um, he had uh, anger issues. And um, he was, uh, you know, there was a lot of domestic violence. And um, there was a... Uh, you know, a lot of um, hiding all that. You know, I, I learned at an early age how to live behind the mask of everything's okay because you don't ever share that stuff with other people, with outsiders. It's kind of like your family secrets. And um, <clears throat> so we had, you know, a lot of family secrets. And um, as a result of that, I felt shame and guilt a lot. And not to mention the, the stuff going on at home, but I also, at school, was kind of a misfit. I didn't really fit in. I was painfully shy, very awkward, awkwardly shy. I was, um, you know, one of those kids. I was that kid that was picked on quite a bit. And I didn't really know how to defend myself or stand up for myself because I didn't believe in myself. I didn't have any self-confidence. Um, I was, uh, I had that, like I said earlier, that sense of shame and guilt for just things that were going on at home. And so when I was out in, in the, you know, at school, I didn't have the strength, that inner strength to stand up for myself. So I was kind of an easy target. And um, so I really didn't have a lot of happiness. I mean, not to make it a poor me story, but I don't really remember being happy a lot growing up. I was kind of a very serious kid and uh, very, uh, <clears throat> 
deep thinker, you know, very thoughtful, kind of inter introspective. Um, introspective. I didn't really, um, I didn't really, I didn't smile a lot, you know, looking back. Um, I just felt like I had a lot of burden. I felt like I had the weight of the world on my shoulders at a very young age. What that taught me was that um, what I chose to do with that was to help other people, try to make it okay in my family life. I learned at an early age to be the fixer, to be the people pleaser, to earn people's love, to earn people's, you know, um, <coughs> to earn people's uh, like of me, love of me. And I learned early on to um, kind of, like I said, wear the masks and pretend so that no one really knew how I was feeling at home. And I think that's very common. I talk to people all the time now that, that learn the same things. You know, adult, adult, uh, adult kids that are learning, that <coughs> learned that from their past, they had to um, wear that mask. And uh, we don't have to wear that mask. And I've learned now to take that mask off and just be who I am. And I, and I love that. Um, but at the time growing up, it was a struggle. And uh, I always dreamed if only I could be pretty. Because I was kind of a, a homely kid, you know. I can say that about myself. I wore big, thick glasses. And um, we didn't have a lot of money, so I kind of had crooked teeth. I've shared about this before in the show. But, um, you know, we had a lot of hand-me-downs. So it wasn't really, it didn't fit in. And so I dreamed if only I could be pretty, that I would have um, popularity. If, if, if only I was pretty, people would love me. If only I was pretty, people would accept me. If only I was pretty this. If only I was pretty that. I had a lot of it only's in my life and uh, when I when I got into high school um, I started to blossom that's very common I kind of grew out of that awkwardness and um, I grew into uh, you know what you would say socially acceptable pretty and uh, I started getting a lot of attention in high school and um, I started to really uh, get that validation that I always sought and that um, that praise from others and the attention that's really what it was. I went from a kid who never got any attention to all of a sudden I'm getting all this attention. And it kind of confirmed for me that my value was in how I looked. Because since I didn't get a lot of attention or validation when I was, you know, homely as a kid, and I say that honestly, when I finally started getting that attention, it validated for me that my worth was in how I looked. And I think many women can relate to that. It's such a world now that's so filled with visual images of the perfect woman, of the beautiful woman, of the skinny woman, you know, whatever it may be, that we have these images that if only we look like her, we could be more happy. If only we look like her, we could have it all. We could have um, all the things that we dream of. We would be happy. And that's simply not true, but I believe that. I really believe that. Because of all the, the, the things that went on at home um, and the sadness and the burden and the, the um, anger and violence that went on at home, I, I really put all my um, I put all my expectation in, in being pretty if that makes any sense at all and um, as I went through my high school years and um, I was a cheerleader and uh, ended up running for Miss Calaveras pageant in 1989 and um, it was during that time, and I was actually always very thin because it kind of runs in my family, but it was during that time that I um, actually tried bulimia and I've shared this on the show before, I actually had a whole show dedicated to eating disorders because I struggled with an eating disorder for about 18 years. And it started in high school and you know, parents, it can happen. It's such a common, it's such a common thing, not just for women to deal with eating disorders, but for men too. And um, when you have one, you feel like you're alone. And when you have one, you feel like it's dirty and you feel like you're, you know, you're ashamed. And for me, just kind of compressed and, um, uh, just magnified the shame and guilt that I already felt in my life from childhood stuff. And now here I am, you know, um, you know, on the outside looked like I had it all together, but really on the inside I was dying. And um, my eating disorder really came from the desire to be perfect. And that perfection was a defense mechanism against the pain I felt from growing up. And um, when I, you know, the desire to be perfect, even though I didn't have any weight problems, the desire, it's so, the desire to be perfect is not logical, it's not reasonable. It can be an obsession. And that's what it became for me. And, um, but I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed as people would give me compliments on how I looked. I thought, if only they knew. If only they knew that I was a fake. If only they knew what really, what kind of horrible person I am on the inside. If they really knew, then they would never love me. And it just, again, reconfirmed how I felt. It reconfirmed all those old feelings. And it just kind of was a vicious cycle. And I think many people can relate to that. And um, so I, uh, 
you know, from, from being a kid growing up in a small town, I always had dreams of being an actress, a famous actress. Now, of course, that makes sense because from someone who didn't get a lot of attention and who felt invisible growing up, um, to me, the idea of being a movie star or a model or any of those things and gaining that fame, again, to me, that seemed like the answer. That was the answer and the key to my happiness. And people would adore me. People would love me. I would get um, approval. And that's really kind of all my life got caught in that trap of seeking approval, of needing other people to validate me, of um, pleasing others, of, um, you know, if, if only I'm good enough, if I perform well enough, then I'll get that approval and that love. And that's really what's driven me the majority of my life. And again, I think many people can relate to that, that, um, you know, living for other people, constantly worrying about other people's opinions. And it's such a nightmare to live that way. And again, I looked okay on the outside. Many people were, are shocked to find out that I felt this way. But this is the life I lived on the inside. And um, I'm just so happy to be able to expose it to the light. And, um, and there's a good part to the story, wonderful part to the story. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that when I come back from break. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back in about three minutes. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. You're watching your local television network, TSPN, and now back to Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Welcome back to Love, Hope, and Faith. And today I'm sharing my testimony. And I was sharing with you in the first segment um, a little bit about my life as a child. And, you know, yeah, I had some difficulties growing up. And, again, I know there's people out there who have had, um, you know, have had it rougher. And um, I, I don't share my testimony to... Um, to you know, wallow in, in the past. I share my testimony so that people can see that no matter where you've been, there's hope. And I found that hope in Jesus. And uh, I love to share that so that people can see and relate and say, yeah, I've been there. And then maybe through my story, you can see that um, if you're not currently you know, uh, believing in the Lord Jesus, that you will, um, you will see that hope through my story, through my life story. And I love how he uses our stories to touch other people. I'm a big believer in just being really transparent with my testimony and, um, and where I've been. and. Uh, to show people that all things are possible through Christ and um, he's done a lot of amazing things in my life and and I'm going to share that today and just some of the things I've learned in, in having a relationship with him and how to have a relationship with him so um, I was sharing with you that after high school, I, I uh, you know, I'd always dreamed of being a model as a kid or an actor because I wanted to get that approval, and I thought that what a great way to do that, you know, go to Hollywood, right? And I had a lot of people told me I should be a model or you know whatever, so I kind of got that 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 uh, feedback from people. So off I run to Hollywood uh, at 19 years old from a little small town, um, Calaveras County. And run off to, to uh, Hollywood, and I'm telling you, what a culture shock. I mean, right away I got, I mean, I found an agent right away, and um, I started going to modeling jobs. It's so funny because I remember my parents, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, like I said, so my parents, to help me, um, they gave me the only other car they had to, to give me, and it was a 1979 Stretch Econoline, Econoline Dodge van with faded red velour interior and primer gray on the outside. I'm not kidding. I wish I had pictures to show you, but it was pretty hysterical. So here I am driving to these modeling auditions and these um, show, you know, uh, acting auditions. And, I'm, you know, these little models and actresses are pulling up in their little sports cars. And here I pull up in this huge van, you know, it's like, move on over, I'm coming in. <laughs> and um, it was really funny, but uh, that's all I had. And it was, you know, it is what it is. So um, anyway, uh, when I got to Hollywood, I, I quickly got kind of in, got connected, got plugged in, and um, did some modeling and did some, I was on a TV show uh, as, an, as, a, as an extra. I was in a movie uh, with Nicolas Cage and Charlie Sheen. Um, actually, I had a, a small speaking role. It was not a very good movie, but had a great cast, and it was a really good experience. But if you think that my issues got better in Hollywood, you're sadly mistaken because, of course, my issues got worse because Hollywood is the uh, epitome of living for the, the, the appearance and the superficiality of it. And it's really, uh, my experience of Hollywood was, uh, was really difficult. It was there that um, my body image issues got worse. My self-esteem got worse. On the inside, on the outside, it looked great because I learned 
early on how to put on that mask, as I said, how to pretend that I had it all together, but really I didn't. And you're constantly comparing yourselves to others as you're competing for these modeling jobs or acting jobs. You're constantly comparing yourself to others, and they're judging you on your appearance. Yeah, you know, your, your hips are too big, your hips are too small, you're not, you know, I wanted a blonde, you're brunette, whatever it may be, you're constantly being judged on how you look. For someone who has an eating disorder and someone who has body image issues and perfectionism issues, it was just like, it was just, you know, it was, it was not the right place to be. Um, but I also got a lot of good feedback and uh, it just reinforced again that I had to be perfect. And um, in Hollywood, um, I met a boyfriend um, much older than me because, of course, I had father issues and uh, ran, ended up running off to New York. And let me just say, what I didn't mention in the beginning is, is there wasn't just me and my family. There was my sister, and uh, my sister, Willow, was four and a half years younger than me. And um, as I think of my testimony and running off to Hollywood, I think about um, my mind naturally goes to the guilt I also felt of leaving my family behind and leaving my sister behind. And because I always was kind of her, um, her big sister. You know, she was my baby sister, and I stood up for her and kind of um, sheltered her from things. Um, and so here I am running off to, you know, to pursue my own dreams, or at least that's what I thought. Really, as it turns out, I was running away, and I didn't know how to deal with all the, the turmoil in my family, and I didn't know how to deal with the turmoil inside myself, um, that, you know, the turmoil that also came from some of the bad decisions I was making. I didn't know how to deal with that, so I just kept running, and I have so, I lived so many years with the guilt of running away. I have to say, I spent a lot of my life running from my problems, not dealing with them, procrastinating on my issues, um, just running. That's how I dealt with things. And um, I ran all the way to New York. After Hollywood, I, like I said, I had a boyfriend. He wanted to take me to, to New York. I ended up going off to New York and spending about two and a half years living in Manhattan. Again, living the fast life, just like Hollywood. I went to all the VIP parties. I was on the guest list for the best clubs. I went to movie premieres. You know, I did all these things. I'm not bragging. I share these things to let you know none of those things got me, gave me peace. None of those things, you know, gave me purpose. None of those things healed my, um, my internal pain. Um, but at the time, it seemed fun, and it seemed adventurous, and I thought I was calling life as I saw it. I was making my own decisions. I was calling my own shots. It seemed at the time that I had it made. Um, yet every day when I'd wake up, I just wondered why I felt a hole in my heart. I felt so alone, you know, in a city of millions of people. I felt so alone, and I didn't know how to go back home. I really wanted to go home. I there's only so much you can do, so many after parties you can go to, and at, at, at the end of the day, it, it's not enough. I was dying inside. I really was. I was so lonely. It just blows my mind how in a city with so many people, I could feel so alone. I felt so misunderstood. I felt so. Um, dark inside, really. And um, it was during that time when I was really contemplating, I was at a major crossroads in my life's journey. I was 20, 24 years old and thought, what, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing with my life? And um, it was during that time that I got a phone call that changed my entire life. Um, I got a phone call that my sister, who I had not talked to in about a year, remember, I told you I had been running and my parents really didn't know how to get a hold of me in New York, and that was intentional. That was on. That was my fault. I I didn't know how to deal with all th with their issues, much less my own issues. So I ran, and I didn't let them know where I was. I was kind of off the radar, off the grid to them. But I did get a phone call that um, my sister had been killed by a drunk driver. And do you know what the crazy thing is? Is that I I had this this heaviness. For months before that phone call, I had this heaviness that something bad was going to happen to my family. Not specifically my sister, but that something bad, something irrevocable, something that I could never take back was going to happen. I had that dread. And I really, I kind of justified it and thought, well, I just feel guilty, so of course I feel that way. But really, it's like I had a knowing. I had a knowing that something was going to happen, and it did. Um, that phone call, just if any of you have suffered the loss of a loved one, especially in a situation like that where there's a, an accident, a, dr a drunk driving accident, it, it's just so much worse, I think, because it's so senseless. Um, 
but it changed my life. I remember when I got that call, it's like the bottom just dropped out. Literally, I, I remember, um, I don't remember it fully, but from what I hear, the people that were around me, I was kind of stumbling around. Um, everything kind of went black. The room kind of swirled around me. Um, and it was just like the disbelief and the, and the knowing at the same time and the inevitability of it and the finality of it. It was so consuming so suffocating. I felt like I was falling down a hole with no bottom. And um, I didn't have anything to hold on to. I had no faith. You know, um, growing up, I had my father didn't believe in Christ at all. He didn't, uh, he forbid us to really know about Jesus. He was really against Christianity. My dad had his own pain to deal with and he couldn't reconcile that pain to Jesus. And so he forbid us. He didn't like Christians. <laughs> um, he, he thought that was stupid. You know, he didn't, there was nothing for us to hold on to. So when I got this devastating news, I had nothing. I didn't know what to believe. I didn't know. I always wanted to, to know God as a child. I remember talking to God a lot. As a child, I remember calling out to him and, and feeling forgotten by him because of the things that were happening I was like God I believe in you but where are you I felt abandoned by him I felt um, forgotten neglected by God um, but there was also at the same time a deep yearning to know him I've always had that deep, deep yearning to know him and um, when my sister died that yearning turned to anger that that sense of being forgotten that sense of being neglected by him um, it turned into anger and I was very angry at God. And I felt that God had made a big mistake, that it should have been me that had been killed because I was the bad one. My sister was home living with my mom. My parents had divorced. My sister um, was the one standing by my mom's side, helping her through the divorce, helping her in her new life. Yet here I was, the older sister, off gallivanting and living life on, you know, on the edge and not being responsible. And um, so when, when she died, it definitely felt like there was a big mistake. And um, it just put me further away from God. Uh, you know, I ran further away from him. And, um, of course, I came right home. Um, and it's so weird because I was at a crossroads in my life living in New, in New York. I was at that crossroads not knowing how to come home but wanting to. And then Willow dies, and I go home. Looking back on it, it's interesting how that how that um, I was forced to come home and um, given a way to come home really and um, it was through through the accident that I became reconciled to, reconciled to God years later I'll share that with you as well but um anyway it's just it was quite an experience and um, came home <coughs> to um, to be with my family and uh, like I said, being angry, I actually went into counseling to determine, you know, to, to kind of get through my grief and um, ask the, I, it was actually a Christian counselor that I went to, that a friend recommended me to, and it was, you know, asking him the classic question, why would something bad happen to someone so good? You know, and that's a question that we all ask at one time in our lives. Why would something so good or so bad happen to someone so good? Why do bad things happen to good people? And um, that question really couldn't be answered. I didn't really stick around long enough to let it be answered as I kind of gall gallivanted off into my life, um, kind of headlong into bad choices as a result of my grief. And um, just spent my 20s really, really not making the best choices. But again, it was a result of not knowing how to deal with the compounding effect of my life choices and the things that happened. And um, about thir at 30 years old, I ended up meeting the love of my life. Um, through getting a job and he was my boss <laughs> but we didn't date as, as he wasn't my boss when we started dating so and uh, he was a Christian and um, started to really kind of open myself up again to the possibility of God and um, was and became a mom and uh, that was I'll never forget the day I brought my daughter home from the hospital and that's the moment that I realized that I was I could begin living for someone other than just myself and that was a big turning point in my life. So when I come back, I'll talk more about that. And uh, we'll be right back in three minutes. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. You're watching your local television network, TSPN. And now back to Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Welcome back to Love, Hope, and Faith. And I've been sharing my testimony today. And I want to—I'm going to speed up a little bit because 
I really want to get to the good stuff, and that's where God came into my life, or I should say that I allowed God into my life because he's always been there. And as I look back on my life, I can see the hand of God working. You know, I mentioned how I, you know, as a child used to cry out to God and um, ask, you know, God, are you there, and do you love me, do you see me? And, um, you know, I look back and I realize that um, God is what got me through all those times. God is who, who got me through and enabled me to use my, my testimony as a way to get closer to Him. And God is the one who, yeah, things did happen that, um, that were painful, but He's who got me through it. And, um, and I see that now so clearly. And I could just talk for hours about how I see that and what He's done in my life. But I want to get back to, to the story of, of my life and, and as an adult and after my sister died. And... Um, I just wanted to reassure you that um, one of my favorite life verses is Romans 8.28 that says, um, All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And I can stand on that promise because I have experienced that so many times in my life. All things work together for good. He does not say some things or a few things or maybe if we're lucky things. No. He says all things. And I have such hope and faith in that statement. And I just want to encourage you that no matter where you are in your life, that that is the truth. And, you know, you could be in circumstances right now that are hard and painful. And I've been there. I've been in, and in my life, just because I'm a Christian now, does not mean that my life is all of a sudden perfect because we still have circumstances. We live life and life is filled with painful things. Absolutely. But in those circumstances, I have a hope and I have um, a joy and a peace and that's in Christ. And, um, and I know that the circumstances are temporary and I have that eternal perspective that's only possible through relationship with God. And I have a deeply committed relationship to the Lord and um, it's made all the difference. It's transformed my life. And that's exactly what this show's about when I have my guests on and they share their testimonies that um, the purpose of that is to that no matter where you've been, there is hope in Christ and that he can use your story. He wants to use your strengths, your spiritual gifts. He wants to use the things you've been through for his glory and, and for beautiful, amazing things. He does far, far more than we can ever ask or imagine um, of ourselves. And, you know, I had these big dreams of becoming an actress and all those things. I look back on that. I hate acting now <laughs> because... For me, in fact, my husband's a director uh, for a local theater company, and I love the, the theater company. It's great, but um, I, he always wants me to, you know, audition for parts, and I'm like, that's going to take away from from me glorifying God. I mean, I can glorify God in all things, but I want to spend my time um, spreading the gospel and sharing the hope and and leading people to Christ, and that's really um, what I'm all about. And uh, that's more than I can ask or imagine. The dreams I had before seemed so small in comparison to, to being able to, to share God's hope and His truth with, with the world. I love that. That's what, I, that's what, that's what I'm passionate about. And um, so how I, how I got there from where I was, from what I've shared, um, is that I just, little by little, um, God just started putting people in my life that were Christians, people that really spoke to me in different situations. And it was at a time when I started really um, opening myself up to the possibility of Him again in my life. And I uh, became a mom and a wife, oh, well, a wife first. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, actually, no, a mom first. Became a mom first and then a wife, um, but, um, which is, which is, uh, something that I, that I wish I had done differently, but it is what it is. And um, my husband and I, we got pregnant and then we got married, but we were going to be getting married anyway, so that's fine. But still, I wish we had done it the right way. But um, we, uh, you know, we, my husband and I both worked at the same place. We had great paying jobs. We had the pool, the cars, the nice home that we had built. We, we had everything together. But I was still living on the inside with that pain and the loneliness and the depression. I struggled a lot with depression. And it's something I hid. Again, remember I talked about wearing those masks? On the outside, I looked like I had it all together. I was actually a trainer, professional, and very involved in professional development. I was a training manager, and so I always was motivating people and inspiring people and always talking the talk and trying to convince myself as much as I convinced everybody else that all we had to do was believe in ourselves and we could make things happen. And But inside, I just wasn't resonating with that. On the inside, I just felt so lost. And on the inside, I was like, what's wrong with me? Here I talk all this big talk about achieving our dreams and, and um, if we can see it, we can achieve it. And yet inside, I didn't feel that way. No amount of self-improvement was helping me 
counseling wasn't even really helping me. I mean, I was gaining understanding into my life, but I was not gaining the healing that I so craved and so desired. I didn't want to live like that anymore. And then um, my husband one day got me a Bible, and um, out of the blue, I woke up one morning to make my coffee before work, and there was a gift wrapped on the kitchen counter, and I opened it up, and it was a Bible for my husband. And he knew I was seeking, and he was a Christian, and... Um, and it, in later that day, he told me, I just hope you, I asked him, why did you get me the, this Bible? And he said, I just, I really hope you find that light that you're looking for. And he really encouraged me to read it. And I began reading the Bible from page one. <laughs> and not having anyone to help me through it, just began reading it. And I did start to feel a peace. But I was also confused. And... Um, I told my husband we need to start going to church, and I wanted to start taking our kids to church because I really wanted our kids to have a foundation. You know, I was really thinking about their foundation, and um, and we started church shopping around. And uh, guess what? We uh, some some new friends in our life introduced us to the Church of the Nazarene, and the Church of the Nazarene is um, the church that we go to now. We've been going there for I think about four years now, and it's just a wonderful church. I mean, we have so many amazing programs there, and the church is. Is just um, really the, from the moment I walked in and heard Pastor Mark Lehman um, toward his message, I knew it was for me. I knew, I mean, I felt like he was speaking directly to me. In fact, I bawled and cried at every single service for the first several months because he was touching, well, I know it was God using Mark to, to touch my heart and speaking directly to me. And that's how the Holy Spirit works when you're in church and um, you have um, that depth of pain that I had or any, any level of pain that you're in, um, the Holy Spirit will minister to you through the pastor, through the people there, and he did big time. I just felt like instantly like it was my family. And I just wanted to kind of touch on the Church of the Nazarene for a minute because it's such a wonderful church. If you're looking for a church and you haven't connected, we have amazing churches in our community. But I, of course, am a little bit biased with my church, and um, we have the Celebrate Recovery Program that I'm very involved in. I'm a leader there in that program and found great healing through that. We have a great youth program on Wednesday nights. Um, we have our Wednesday night refill um, where people can come and, and re get reconnected throughout the week. We have our men's ministry, women's ministry. We just have so many great ministries in our church and it's a wonderful family so please do come and check us out. We have service at 8.30 on Sunday mornings and then again at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And um, we have just, this is just a wonderful church family. So I got connected right away to the church and um, and really, the Lord just began doing amazing things in my life. And um, very early on in my walk with the Lord, I really want to share this part of the story with you. Um, I happened to be at some friend's house. And uh, mind you, at this time, my sister's accident had been about 14 years earlier. And I still had a lot of pain and anger about the accident. And I, the person who was driving the car actually died in the accident. And my sister's best friend, Kathy, she also died. So three people died that night. And even though um, and I was a brand new believer and I was so filled with God's love and I was so excited and he was showing me so many amazing things and I was like on fire for Jesus but I still had that anger inside and guilt about my sister's accident one day I'm at some friend's house uh, four years ago and um, and we're talking and they introduced it was like a little get together and uh, we were having coffee and, and, and getting to know this other couple and they're very nice and they're Christians and they start sharing with me um, that they you know had lived in Calaveras County for many years and so we kind of had that in common and I asked them what they did for a living and they said that they were um, that they were uh, had been in the mortgage business for many years and I said oh well what company do you work for and the, and the man tells me the company he worked for, which I was very familiar with, because it was a company that had the Christmas party that 14 years earlier, the man had left from that Christmas party from that company and had driven his car into my sister's car. And, um, and, and the, when he said the name, and I don't want to say the name of the company um, on the air, but when he said the name of the company, it's like my whole everything stopped. My heart stopped. I not heard the name of that company or the name of the owner of the company since the accident. And I had been harboring anger and lack of forgiveness because the owner of the company had given the keys to the drunk driver, his employee. And, um, and, the, and you know what happened next. Um, they actually had a party and they told their people, you know, that they'd be taking people's keys because they didn't want people drinking and driving, which is a good thing. But then at some point through the night, his employee came to him and said he wanted to go home. And um, the, the owner, you know, 
thought that he was okay to drive apparently, but witnesses said that he was not, and it was apparent that he was had been had a lot had too much to, to drink, and so. Because the driver died, I was very um, focused on my energy and my anger on the owner of the company. <clears throat> if he hadn't given the keys, my sister would still be alive. And even though that may sound unreasonable to you, that's my anger was so focused on him. For so many years, I, I hated him. And now here I am, 14 years later, sitting in these people's home that worked at the same company during, right after that time. And we're actually very good friends with the owner. And all of a sudden, I just had this welling up of like... Um, this welling up of purpose. As I'm speaking to them, I'm not even aware of really what I'm saying, but I knew that there was a mission to me being at that house. And I said to them, do you still stay in contact with him? And they said, yeah, we're good friends. And I said, I want to call him. And they said, for what? And I said, I want to forgive him. And I promise you, I had never once thought about calling him to forgive him. I never even, in my selfish grief, in my pain, I never once thought about what they went through, being the ones who gave the keys to the driver that killed himself and two other kids. I never even thought about about um, what they were going through as a family, how that changed their lives, the guilt they must have felt. And here I am, 14 years later, at a party, randomly, right, where I didn't even know any of these people, and now here they are with the opportunity for me and I ended up calling him. I got the phone number. I was so scared I didn't know what to say. It took me a week of prayer and meeting with my pastors to get encouragement and finally a week later I called him and I was able to offer my forgiveness to him for being a part of that of the death of my sister. And that forgiveness, I'm telling you, the moment I forgave him, my whole life immediately changed. It's like this tremendous weight. I felt like a million pounds just lift off my shoulders. And I felt the forgiveness for the first time of my father. I felt forgiveness of so many of the things that I was not forgiving my whole life. And um, I'm going to take a break. When we come back, I'll, I'll t finish up that story. Come back. Thanks. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. You're watching your local television network, TSPN. And now back to... Love, Hope, and Faith with Heather Murdoch. Welcome back to Love, Hope, and Faith. And uh, I was sharing how when I was able to finally forgive the persons responsible for um, the death of my 19-year-old sister, um, it completely changed my life. And I know many of you out there have um, struggled with forgiveness. And many, many of you out there have, have um, felt the gift of forgiveness in your life and know what I'm talking about when I say that it is life-changing. And, and earlier in the show, I talked about how I was going to share some things that really shaped me and changed me and, 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 um, and helped me to get closer to God. And uh, that's, that's a huge one, the forgiveness, because not only was I able to forgive the, the people responsible, or at least who I you know, had blamed for many years, but also I was able to forgive my dad for the things that, um, that, that he did. And, you know, my dad, he has his own, his own hurt in his life that he didn't know how to deal with either and it resulted in manifesting in his as a father you know and I've been able to let that go and I've been able to move forward and I've also well, maybe one of the biggest things the two biggest things for me um, was I was able to um, forgive uh, myself and because I blamed myself, if only I had been there to protect my sister, like I had been in the past, this may not have happened. That's what I thought all those years, and I was able to forgive myself. I was able to let go of all the shame and guilt, and um, I was also able to forgive God. And that may seem silly to you, like, who am I to forgive God? But in my heart, I was angry at God for many years, and I was able to let go of that, and able to just free fall into God's arms, and just really surrender, and... When I tell you that um, it was a physical letting go, I, I mean that. I felt this weight lift, but it was also a weight from my heart that just let go. It's like I just, I just, th that, that darkness that was in my, in my heart was replaced with a peace and a light, a lightness. And, you know, we talk about, you know, scripture tells us that, um, that, um, that Jesus says his burden is, is light, his yoke is light, I should say, to let go of our burdens, that his yoke is light, and I felt that in my life. And um, come to him, all who need rest, and, and just um, submit to him, because he will carry us, and he has carried me. And, um, 
And when I was able to let that go, my relationship with Jesus also got deeper because that was coming in between him and I. Even though I was totally, uh, had this radical transformation from almost day one of becoming a believer, I just like went from almost just like, almost just like from dark to light, almost instantaneously it feels like to me. It happened so quickly. But when I was able to forgive, my relationship with him just went so much deeper. And one day, as I was reflecting on all the things that the Lord had showed me and all the changes he was making in my life, and I'm still not done, he's still changing me, all of a sudden, I like almost sat bolt upright. And I had this realization that for the past six months prior to that, maybe longer, maybe almost a year, I had not had one thought of my bulimia because as you know, as I shared, I struggled with my bulimia on and off for 18 years. No one knew about it except for my mom. I did end up sharing it with my husband um, several years ago but because um, I just felt so guilty and I wanted help and I, I told myself I'm going to share this with my husband and I'm going to allow him to help me when in the end I chickened out and instead of telling him that it's something I still dealt with, I told him that I used to struggle with bulimia. Well, so I never got he, I never was honest with him fully um, until um, when I came to the Lord and had that realization that I had not had one thought of it. I had not had one iota of thought. Not one thought of indulging in my eating disorder. Not one thought about my body image. Not one thought that I had to be perfect. Not one. I was blown away. I've heard of people being delivered from things, but I've experienced it. And it's been almost four years now, and I have not had one episode of my bulimia. Not one. Not one thought. I'm completely different. And for me, what I believe is that I found who I am in Christ. I don't have to please other people. And yes, sometimes I still fall back in those old thoughts. Sometimes I still find myself wanting to, to get approval. I'm human. We're all human. We're still going to struggle with those things. But it's, it's much less much fewer and further between. It takes, it, it, it lasts, it, it, you know, it, it's, a very, it's momentary compared to, like, for an example, maybe I'll have thoughts that, that fleet in and out, or maybe I'll go through, you know, a day or two of, of, of those old ways. But it used to be that's all that was there. And now it's just few and far between because Christ is working on me and I'm letting him. You know, you hear about the stories in the Bible of people that were that had miracles in their lives. And I've had miracles in my life. There's more, too, that I could just share with you. He still works miracles. People will say, you know, I wish that um, I lived back in the Bible times when, he, when Jesus was around and he was doing these amazing miracles and he was here on earth. He is here right now. And he does do miracles. And he does set us free. And it reminds me of the, the scripture that I love. Um... It's from Isaiah. It's one of my favorites. Isaiah 61. And it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And... Um, I love that scripture so much. It's so amazing, and it's just so true. I've experienced these things. I used to wear a crown of ashes, and now I wear a crown of beauty because of Jesus. And um, it's just so, it's really incredible to be a part of this. It's really incredible to be a part of his life and have him be a part of my life. And, and um, my vision for my life is that I can be deeply committed to him and encourage others and lead others to be deeply committed to Him. We don't have to live mediocre lives. We don't have to live lives in sin. We have freedom from that, and it's through Him. But not just through having knowledge of Him, but through having a relationship with Him. And that's, to me, that's everything. I don't sit here on this couch, on this TV show, as an expert. I've only been a Christian for about four years, as I mentioned. I'm not um, a pastor but I'm someone who's deeply in love with Jesus and who is committed to sharing that love and truth with others. And um, I just all I have to offer is my experiences and, and the, the relationship I have with him. And, you know, it goes, you know, um, the relationship with Jesus is more than a religion, so much more than a religion. 
In fact, I don't even like to call it a religion. It's a relationship. <laughs> and it's, it's love is what it is. It's true love. And um, one of the things that's really helped me in having a deeper relationship with um, Jesus is the Celebrate Recovery Program that I mentioned to you or mentioned to you in the very beginning of the show or maybe last segment. And the Celebrate Recovery Program is a Christ-centered 12-step program that uh, is available at the Nazarene Church. However, it's an international program and it's been in like 60, I think it's in, I don't have the numbers exactly, but I think it's in like 60 millions of people literally have been helped by the Celebrate Recovery Program. But what I want you to know is, it's for people like me. It's for people like you. It's for people that, um, you know, it says recovery, so people immediately think that it's for people with addictions, and it is. It does wonderful work for people with addictions, but it also is for people that have habits, hurts, and hang-ups. All the things I've shared in my testimony today. And um, it's, it's so interesting because as I was at a Bible study for my church, right after the forgiveness um, thing happened, um, I was sharing, I, I just was sharing that story with so many people. And I was in a Thursday morning Bible study and I shared that story with my church. I mean, I'm sorry, with the women in my Bible study. And um, it was so interesting because one of the, the women that was in the group, she was staring at me as I was speaking and sharing the story. And she kept staring at me intently. And after I get done telling the story, and so many women are emotional and they're crying over the forgiveness because they're thinking about their own lives and they're just, you know, just in awe of what have God, how He led me there and, and gave me the opportunity to forgive. And one of the ladies is staring at me very intently. And um, she, afterwards, she says, um, I need to talk to you about that party. Okay, so this is, again, you know, this is 15 years. So as I was saying there, um, my so this woman is intently listening to my story and pulls me aside after, and she tells me that she was at that party. She was at the Christmas party that where the man was who left that party and then drove into my sister. She was there 15 years prior in a different county. Here she is 15 years now in later in my church Bible study. She had been at that party because she was also an employee of that um, of that company and she knew the, the driver. She would actually been um, uh, encouraging him to, um, to he, he admitted to her that he was an alcoholic and um, and she was worried about him. It was her coworker, and she was leading an AA group, and she had been encouraging him to come to AA, and he was um, kind of in denial and, and not going and kind of blowing her off, and she was at that party. She saw his drinking. She was worried that she ended up leaving early because it just was uncomfortable, and then he drove into my sister after leaving that party, and so here we are now, 15 years later, and she's there, and she gets, she felt guilty too all of those years, not being able to do anything, and my story blessed her because she was able to see how the Lord worked it out and how um, the forgiveness and it was amazing and um, so and it turns out that she's the leader of the Celebrate Recovery Program and encouraged me um, m weeks later some other people encouraged me to come into the CR program um, to um, get through all that stuff because God had delivered me but I had to do the work and learn more about him and how to apply his truth to my hurts and how to apply his truth to to um, helping other people through their hurts and that's what the Celebrate Recovery Program is all about and it's just amazing I know that I'm right where I'm supposed to be in this program and um, it's a program a Christ-centered recovery program that's built on the eight uh, on eight principles that are founded on the Beatitudes, and uh, we meet every Friday night at the Church of the Nazarene, and it's a wonderful program, and it's really um, instrumental in helping me to be where I am now. So we're going to go to break, and uh, we'll see you soon. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN.